Cassander died of edema in 297 BCE. Cassander, the son of Antipater and the murderer of Alexander the Great's mother and son, is arguably the most notorious figure among a group of men who were all power-hungry cutthroats. In this video, I will argue that while Cassander's reputation for ruthlessness is certainly deserved, we should not fall prey to thinking that he was worse than his contemporaries in any meaningful way, and we should also never make the mistake of assuming that without Cassander, Alexander IV would have had a chance to inherit his father's empire. On the contrary, although Cassander's hands were bloody, he used those bloody hands to strengthen the Macedonian state, and his work kept Macedon strong and relevant throughout the Hellenistic period. Cassander was several years younger than Alexander the Great, having been born around 350 BCE. One of Antipater's older sons, Cassander did not grow up as the oldest, but by the time that Alexander died in 323, Cassander was the oldest living son of Antipater. It is not clear how many brothers Cassander had, but there were a large number, and most of them would serve as generals under Cassander and proved to be important players once he emerged as the ruler of Macedon. Since he was a little too young for Alexander's initial campaign and his father was the region of Macedon, Cassander stayed in Macedon for the duration of Alexander's Asian expedition. Most of the details that we have about Cassander's early life seem to have been derived from a hostile tradition trying to drive a narrative about him being a cowardly murderer with a lifelong hatred for Alexander and his family. In one tradition, Macedonian men were not allowed to recline on dining couches at banquets until they had scored a kill on the hunt. This is something that Macedonian aristocratic youths typically accomplished as teenagers. Cassander was supposedly not strong or brave enough to pull off this feat until he was 30 or older. If this story is true, then it is most likely the result of Cassander's generally poor health and should not be taken as a meaningful indictment of his character. Another story has Cassander visiting Alexander in Babylon shortly prior to the great king's death and getting in a heated argument over Alexander's adoption of Persian dress and customs. The major issue with this story is that it is used to give Cassander a motive to kill Alexander and to build a narrative that they were bitter lifelong enemies. However, many Macedonians objected to Alexander's actions to his face, Alexander's most determined enemies tended to die, and since Alexander's cohort growing up had been composed of men the same age or even several years older, it seems unlikely that the younger Cassander would have had enough interactions with Alexander for the two of them to develop a mutual hatred, and certainly nothing like the kind of mutual hatred that we sometimes hear about in our sources. Another Cassander story, which drives the Cassander as murderer narrative, is that Cassander arrived in Babylon with a secret poison that he gave to his brother Elias, Alexander's cupbearer. Cassander, either on his father's orders or acting on his own accord, was going to murder Alexander to prevent his elderly father from being summoned to Babylon and deprived of his office as regent. Most likely, this story was concocted by Olympias, a lifelong enemy of Antipater, or it was hatched by Antigonus or one of Cassander's other rivals as a way to discredit him. Alexander's final illness is poorly understood and based on the known symptoms could have come from an illness or from poison. To assume that Cassander was responsible simply because Cassander later eliminated Olympias and Alexander IV is to retcon his hatred for Olympias and ambition for kingship into the past and to ignore the events of his life between 323 and 309. For that reason, I think that we can safely dismiss the poison story. Although we have no direct evidence of Cassander's actions prior to 323, it is likely that he served under his father's direction and acquired a considerable amount of experience in government and military affairs. Unless he commanded units and armies during this period, it is hard to, hard to see when he had the opportunity to acquire the military skills that he would demonstrate early and often during the wars of the successors. Following Alexander's death, Cassander was at Babylon but he seems to have played no notable part in the negotiations there. Perhaps he represented his father to some extent, but he seems to have been very much confined to the background. When compared to the bodyguards and other political heavyweights who had marched with Alexander, Cassander was an obscure figure, 
whose only deeds to that point had consisted of service under his own father. In the settlement at Triparadisus, Antipater arranged the empire to suit his own interest, and he set up marriages between his children and the grandees of the empire. Cassander does not seem to have been married to anyone's daughter or sister during this time. To put his relatives and allies in positions of power as much as possible, Antipater tried to check Antigonus's authority as the general of Asia by appointing Cassander to be his second in command. Aside from observing Antigonus, arguing with the one-eyed general, and reporting back to his father, it is unclear if Cassander did much during this period. Cassander seems to have wanted to remove Antigonus from office, but despite his pleas, his father was only willing to strip Antigonus of the guardianship of the joint kings and to end Cassander's time as his deputy. In late 320 BCE, Antipater returned to Europe and Cassander accompanied his ailing father. As the old man lay dying, Cassander stayed by his father's sickbed. Whether he and Antipater were a truly close father-son pair, or whether Cassander was seeking to improve his inheritance, is impossible to determine with the amount of evidence that we have. Antipater ultimately decided that Polyperchon would succeed him as the general of Europe and the guardian of the two kings. The negative view of Cassander seems to interpret Cassander's service as a second-in-command and lack of campaign experience beside Alexander as a sign that he was unqualified to hold power. A couple of modern scholars have even suggested that perhaps Antipater was fearful that power would go to Cassander's head the way that it had gone to Alexander's head, which ignores the fact that Cassander was 30 or older by 319, significantly older than the 20-year-old Alexander who had taken over Philip's kingdom in 336. As I proposed in my video on Polyperchon, the real reason why Antipater gave the offices to Polyperchon was probably a desire to honor the spirit of the Triparadisus agreement that he had overseen and to avoid putting Cassander in a situation where he would have to contend with a very powerful and uncooperative antagonist the One-Eyed, with whom Cassander had already experienced friction not long before. Although Cassander seems to have acceded to his father's wishes and agreed to be a deputy yet again, this seems to have been little more than his way of easing his father's anxieties. Even before Antipater breathed his last, Cassander was busy contacting his many brothers and all of the various allies of his father in building an alliance against Polyperchon. Following his father's funeral, Cassander left Pella on the grounds that he was going on a hunting trip. Instead of going to hunt boars, Cassander made for the Piraeus, where the garrison commander Nicanor, not to be confused with Cassander's brother Nicanor, had taken control of the strategic port and had declared his allegiance to Cassander. From his base here, Cassander began to formulate a grand strategy with which he could challenge the dominant position of Polyperchon. To combat the power and authority of Polyperchon, Cassander would need the backing of one or more of the established men in the empire. Despite his earlier problems with Antigonus, Cassander found him to be a receptive audience. Cassander wanted to get rid of Polyperchon, and Antigonus wanted to replace Polyperchon, who legally had the power to relieve him of command, with a rebel whose orders he could more easily brush aside. In Macedon, there were men who were loyal to Antipater and Cassander, and Cassander corresponded with them, although we really don't have any indication that this accomplished much outside of putting targets on their backs for Queen Olympias later. In Greece, Cassander had a ready pool of allies, since Antipater had established many new oligarchies in Greece following the end of the Lemian War in 322 BCE. The internal politics of the Greek polis at this time typically involved an ongoing struggle between rich oligarchs and democrats of more humble means. Since the time of Philip II, the democrats had tended to oppose Macedon, while the oligarchs had tended to want an alliance with Macedon, which they tended to admire for its strength and the way that Macedon empowered its elites. While this is an oversimplification of the issue and the internal politics of many Greek polis are either largely unknown or far more complex when we do have available information, this basic dichotomy was still actionable intelligence so far as the Macedonians were concerned. By asking for the aid of Macedonian garrisons and the oligarchies that they upheld, Cassander transformed his kingdom's policy of controlling Greece into a partisan struggle 
between Macedonians. Polyperchon was more or less forced to follow suit. The Antipatrid oligarchies had exiled many opponents and their exactions had left many Greeks eager for a regime change. When Polyperchon announced that he was now supporting freedom for the Greeks and that he was planning to put democratic factions back in power with the aid of the royal army, Greece erupted into a series of civil wars as exile streamed home. Cassander had only himself to blame for putting Polyperchon in a pincer, which made him take drastic action. Now faced with revolts and civil wars throughout Greece, Cassander could not quite possess the initiative. The Athenian Democrats supporting Polyperchon retook control of Athens, but were unable to dislodge Nicanor from the Piraeus, where he was secure in the well-fortified harbor. When Polyperchon brought the royal army of over 20,000 men to Attica, logistics began to play into Cassander's hands. While there is a lively debate as to how much food Attica could grow and the degree of Athens' dependence on food imports, it seems clear that the oligarchic leaders of 319 had not pre-planned for the return of 12,000 exiles and the arrival of 20,000 Macedonian soldiers, much less the horses and war elephants that they brought with them. With the Piraeus under Cassander's control, importing food was much more difficult for Polyperchon's side. After initially thinking that he could storm the Piraeus, Polyperchon quickly abandoned this design and finally decided that he needed to take the royal army out of Attica to prevent a famine. While this was going on, Cassander sailed into the Piraeus with 4,000 men, 35 ships, and a sum of money that he had received from Antigonus on the thin pretext that Antigonus was just simply helping out the son of an old friend. While Polyperchon was campaigning in the Peloponnese, Cassander sent the bulk of his fleet under General Nicanor to the Hellespont to assist Antigonus, who was trying to secure passage in order to attack Polyperchon via Thrace. Polyperchon was supported in this area by Clytos the White, the best admiral of his day. Nicanor lost an initial head-to-head -head naval encounter with the loss of a few dozen vessels. When Clytos held a celebration on shore to commemorate his victory, Antigonus and Nicanor launched a surprise attack and eliminated the megalomaniacal admiral, who saw himself as the living embodiment of Poseidon. Perhaps luckily for Cassander, Antigonus decided to chase Eumenes to the east rather than crossing into Europe. Despite General Nicanor's achievements at the Piraeus and his perseverance in the naval war against Clytos, Cassander was dissatisfied with him. Summoning his general to a conference, he had him executed for something like ambition or arrogance. This leaves us with a lot to unpack. Since Cassander frequently employed Prepolaeus, a general who has several recorded losses and no known victories, this move probably had nothing to do with his incompetence or his naval loss to Clytos. What did Cassander fear from Nicanor then? Most likely, Cassander heard rumors that Nicanor's ego was growing and that he was beginning to entertain ideas about achieving independence. Knowing that Nicanor had been exposed to the charismatic Antigonus, perhaps Cassander feared that the rich master of Western Asia would use bribery to suborn his own subordinate. The execution of Nicanor seems to reinforce the impression that Cassander was utterly ruthless, but always rational. After the city of Megalopolis dealt Polyperchon a bloody and humiliating defeat, Cassander sprang into action and worked to reverse the gains that the democratic factions in Greece had made. It seems that once Polyperchon withdrew to Macedon to court Olympias that his Greek supporters lost heart and that Cassander was able to make a considerable amount of progress. At some point, Cassander settled down for what he assumed would be a quick siege at one city where the Democrats were holding out. It was at this point that Cassander made a quick visit to Macedon and formed an alliance with Queen Adia and King Philip III. It is unclear whether Cassander or Adia was the author of the alliance between them. Both sides, however, had plenty to gain from mutual cooperation. For Adia, she wanted to make herself and her husband the true legitimate monarchs, whereas Polyperchon's embrace of Olympias meant that he had thrown in his lot with Alexander IV. Cassander, the son of Antipater, knew that his father and Olympias had been mortal enemies, so by comparison, the strong-willed and ambitious Adia was a far preferable ally.
Cassander promised Adia that he would bring his troops north and take command of the Macedonian army against Polyperchon and Olympias. However, Cassander got bogged down in a siege which took longer than he had anticipated, and he did not arrive in time to help Adia. As it turned out, Adia and Olympias appeared at the heads of their respective armies, and the Macedonians defected to Olympias as a block. The question that this raises for me is whether Cassander genuinely could not extract himself from Greece, or whether he was glad to have one of the two royal couples taken out for him. Since it would be virtually impossible for anyone to have predicted the way that the confrontation between Olympias and Adia played out, I think that it makes the most sense to assume that Cassander was tied down with commitments in Greece that he saw as more pressing than helping Adia. Polyperchon's prestige had foundered when he had backed away from the Piraeus and then failed to capture Megalopolis, so perhaps Cassander's first concern was to avoid suffering a defeat which might shatter his prestige. After concluding his immediate business in Greece, Cassander decided to return to Macedon in 316 BCE. Olympias had made some preparations, such as arranging for the Aetolians to oppose his passage overland. She had also divided her armies into three and purged the population of Cassander's partisans. However, Cassander was not deterred by these obstacles. Getting past the Aetolians with no real problem, Cassander then divided his own army into three units. One unit was sent to contain Polyperchon and was most likely little more than a phantom army. Arriving in Thessaly unexpectedly, Cassander frightened Olympias, who then sought refuge in the city of Pydna without having stocked sufficient provisions for her sizable force. Leaving that city under siege, Cassander then raced north to inflict a quick defeat on Aristonomus of Pella, who then holed up in Amphipolis. Returning to Pydna, Cassander laid siege in earnest. Polyperchon attempted to relieve Pydna, but Cassander intercepted him. Olympias's purges and Polyperchon's fresh failure at Megalopolis had reduced his prestige with the army to the point that Cassander was able to dissolve the opposing force with some well-placed bribes. The nub of Polyperchon's army slinked away to Greece. Returning to his siege lines outside Pydna, Cassander intercepted a letter from Polyperchon to Olympias where the two were discussing options for a breakout attempt. Seeking to crush Olympias' spirit after her cruelty to his family, which had included spreading the rumor that Cassander himself had been behind Alexander's murder, and also disturbing the graves of Cassander's two dead brothers, Elias and Nicanor, Cassander decided to do something pretty dirty and pretty clever. He forged a letter from Polyperchon offering a rescue boat and set a date and time. Olympias went to the designated rendezvous spot, and her hopes were deflated when no one showed up. With her troops starving, dying, and deserting, Olympias agreed to surrender after Cassander swore an oath that he would not harm her. Cassander offered the same terms to Aristonous at Amphipolis, and he too accepted. Cassander was now in full control of Macedon. Due to the dangers of killing any Argeid and the oath that he had sworn to not harm her, Cassander could not simply have Olympias executed. Rather, he needed to find some legal and legitimate means of being rid of her. Cassander eventually decided to put both Olympias and Aristonous on trial with juries composed of the families of their victims and without giving them the right to speak in their own defense. The trial apparently lasted for days or even weeks and Cassander at one point believed that Olympias would be acquitted due to her status as Alexander's mother. Cassander tried to present her with an escape route so that she would flee and he could have killed her legally for evading justice, but Olympias did not fall for the trick. In the end, however, Olympias's bloodthirsty overreach was too much, and her jury voted to have her executed. Cassander had considerable difficulty getting his men to carry out the sentence, but ultimately they did just that. Even with the legal cover provided by the trial, Cassander knew that he had just made himself vulnerable in the eyes of the Macedonian people, who were still fiercely loyal to the Argeid house. To further cement his position at home, Cassander took a few key steps. First, he held state funerals to honor Cunane, Adia, and Philip III, all three of whom were Argeids who had been killed by the actions of other Macedonians, 
and the last two of whom were victims of Olympias in particular. Second, Cassander decided that the new residence of young Alexander IV would be in Amphipolis, a Greek city on the Macedonian coast, where he would presumably not have a great deal of contact with the Macedonian rank and file, who would otherwise perhaps grow to attach to him if he were to preside in a place like Pella. Cassander's third and probably most important move was to marry Thessaloniki, a daughter of Philip II and a Thessalian woman. Thessaloniki had been close to her stepmother Olympias growing up and had even endured the siege of Pydna with her, but now she dedicated herself to Cassander's cause. Aged 30 to 35 at the time of her marriage to Cassander, Thessaloniki was close in age to her new husband and bore him three sons, about whom I have made a video entitled The Last Antipatrids, if you're interested in learning more about them. Cassander honored his new wife and his connection to the Argeid house in grand fashion. Going to the city of Therma, Cassander enhanced the city by adding the populations of 26 nearby villages and renamed the city Thessalonica in 315 BCE. Today's Thessaloniki, this city eclipsed Pella as Macedon's most important city during the reign of the Antigonid dynasty in Macedon. Thessalonica remained an important city under the Romans, and it was the empire's second city for much of the Byzantine period. The second city of modern Greece, many tourists regard Thessaloniki as the nicest city in all of Greece. Despite the greater long-term significance of Thessalonica, Cassander's first urban foundation, the city of Cassandrea, founded in 316 BCE, was probably intended to be his new capital. Built on the ruins of Potidaea, the site of a famous Athenian siege from the early Peloponnesian War, Cassandrea was the wealthiest city in Macedon during Cassander's reign. It may have been during his lifetime when he dug a canal near the city and tried to transform the city into a naval base. In addition, Cassander ordered that the cities of Olynthus and Thebes be rebuilt. Thebes had been destroyed on Alexander's orders, so Cassander's enemies predictably construed this as a repudiation of Alexander's legacy. However, the antiquity and significance of Thebes made its restoration an excellent way for Cassander to demonstrate his largesse to the Greeks. From the outset, Cassander showed himself to be an active state builder. Macedon had been somewhat weakened and depopulated by the departure of all of the men who had marched under Alexander and were now governing Egypt and Asia. Cassander's reign would lead to the economic and demographic recovery of Macedon to the point that it recovered the kind of power that it had enjoyed under Philip II. Cassander laid the blueprint for how to rule Macedon successfully as a non-Argeid, and the later Antigonid dynasty would essentially follow Cassander's policies. Polyperchon had not abandoned his hopes for controlling Macedon, and in 315 he made a bargain with Antigonus, who was fresh off of his victory over Eumenes. In the proclamation of Tyre, Antigonus declared that Cassander was not the legitimate guardian of the kings and that his execution of Olympias made him a usurper. It is unclear how much damage this piece of propaganda did to Cassander, but certainly the arrival of Antigonid troops in both Asia Minor and in Greece posed a danger. Ptolemy and Lysimachus, for their part, supported Cassander's claim to the regency over that of Antigonus because Cassander was far weaker and posed less of a danger to their own power. In 314, Antigonus the One-Eyed was in control of almost the entirety of Alexander's empire, aside from Europe and Egypt. That year, Cassander joined Ptolemy, Lysimachus, and Seleucus in forming a coalition to oppose Antigonus's ambition before it engulfed their own hopes and dreams. Cassander faced a two-front conflict. He dispatched an army to Asia Minor to put pressure on Antigonus there and hopefully forestall an invasion of Macedon via the Hellespont. In Greece, Antigonus sent money, troops, and his general Aristomitus of Miletus to reinforce Polyperchon. Cassander seems to have initially tried to hold the line in Greece while using diplomacy to try to detach one of the enemy commanders. He offered Polyperchon the position of general of the Peloponnese, but Polyperchon refused his overture. In Asia, Cassander's forces fared poorly, failing to besiege the city of Amissus, which was relieved by Antigonus's nephew Polymeus. After achieving next to nothing aside from creating a distraction, 
Cassander's army in Asia withdrew. In Greece, Antigonus had repeated Polyperchon's freedom decree, but with a new twist. Antigonus promised not only democracy, but also autonomy in foreign affairs and freedom from Macedonian garrisons. Had this offer been made to the Greeks when they were fresher and had had more time to recover from their latest bout of civil war, then they would have been far more eager and less skeptical of the offer. Autonomy and an end to garrisoning was a dream for the Greeks, and it must have seemed too good to be true. It appears that this decree either failed to convince the Greeks of Antigonus' sincerity, or else the Antigonid forces in Greece were too weak to take advantage of public sentiment. While it appeared that Antigonus was about to invade Macedon at one point when he arrived in Asia Minor and assumed personal command, the one-eyed general of Asia eventually had to shift his attention to Babylonia when Seleucus raised the revolt in his old satrapy, and that became the most important front of the Third War of the Successors. With Antigonus distracted, Cassander was able to concentrate his main army in Greece. Despite Antigonus' efforts to reinforce Greece with Aristomedes' mercenaries, Cassander's Macedonian army was simply too much for them. Cassander captured many cities in the Peloponnese in 314, presided over the Nemean Games, and then returned to Macedon. Aristomedes and Polyperchon's son Alexander struggled in vain to retake Cassander's recent gains. At the end of this year's campaign, Cassander effectively recruited Alexander the son of Polyperchon, who defected and brought with him the key cities of Corinth and Sicyon. When Alexander died soon after his defection, his widow Cratisipolis took up this position and held Corinth and Sicyon on Cassander's behalf. Despite the best efforts of Aristomedus, Telesphorus, and Polymeus, Cassander's position in Greece remained strong, largely thanks to the efforts of Cratisipolis. While Cassander was tempted at various times to make a separate peace with Antigonus, he did not do so. This probably kept him in good stead with Lysimachus and Ptolemy, who would have felt betrayed after they had gone to war largely to support Cassander's claims. Ultimately, once Seleucus had established himself in Babylon, Ptolemy and Lysimachus also felt that Antigonus had been sufficiently checked for the moment, and they decided to join Cassander in concluding a peace with Antigonus in 311. This peace excluded Seleucus, so the war in Babylon continued from 311 to 309, resulting in a victory for Seleucus, who was able to establish his independence. Antigonus was still the strongest player on the international stage, but he was no longer completely dominant. With Antigonus's prestige eroding, Cassander was able to secure the defection of Antigonus's wayward nephew Polymeus, which greatly shifted the balance of power in the Peloponnese in favor of Cassander. In 309 BCE, Cassander made his most infamous and historically significant decision. Alexander IV, still living at Amphipolis with his mother, was about 13 to 14 years old and thus on the brink of manhood. If he were to live for just a couple more years, then the Macedonian army would most likely demand that he be given a role in public life, thus short-circuiting Cassander's own budding aspirations for a crown. Cassander seems to have kept Alexander IV around partly as a potential wildcard to play against Antigonus, should things get dicey. With his position seemingly secure enough to sustain a hit, Cassander decided to have Alexander IV and Roxanne murdered, thus eliminating the last legitimate heir to the empire. While Cassander almost certainly did this to advance his own ambitions, this action was a great gift to Ptolemy, Antigonus, and the others, as it gave them an excuse to claim kingship in their own names as well. Despite the predictability of this deed, it still shocked the greater Macedonian world, and not surprisingly, was used as a talking point against Cassander by his enemies. While the murder of young Alexander IV has been used to blacken Cassander's name, it is hard to see how or why he would have taken any other course of action at that time. Cassander had effectively been the king of Macedon in all but name since 316 BCE. If he were to try to serve honestly as Alexander's regent and restore the empire, his opponents would simply argue that Cassander was manipulating the king and that he couldn't be trusted due to his murder of Olympias and on the grounds of other existing smears. Had Alexander IV been in the custody of one of the other successors, 
then it is hard to imagine that any of them would have served as faithful regents or that Alexander would have lived to achieve adulthood or anything better than puppet status. In 309, either simultaneous with or immediately after Cassander's decision to execute Alexander IV, Antigonus decided to play his wild card by sending Alexander's illegitimate son Heracles to Polyperchon so that he could make a bid for Macedon. Raising 20,000 supporters in the name of the Argead House, Polyperchon reached the border of Macedon, where Cassander met him. We don't know how strong Cassander's army was, nor do we know if Cassander's recent bloody deed had resuscitated Polyperchon's prestige by proxy, so it is hard to know exactly how strong the bargaining position of each party was. Cassander managed to win Polyperchon over to his cause with the offer of money, troops, his old estates, and Macedon, and the title General of the Peloponnese, which he already held, but now the title would come from Cassander rather than Antigonus. In exchange, Polyperchon executed Heracles soon thereafter, thus eliminating a major threat to Cassander in exchange for offering his military aid to Cassander against a new threat posed by Ptolemy. While Plutarch thinks that this episode demonstrates Polyperchon's weak will, you could make an equally valid argument that it represents Cassander's mastery of diplomacy, since he gained security in exchange for nothing of real value. While Polyperchon was trying to install Heracles, Ptolemy's fleet entered the Aegean and he began recruiting allies in Greece in preparation for a landing. Ptolemaeus, who had just recently cast in his lot with Cassander, quickly decided to side with Ptolemy instead. Rather than utilizing the generalship of Antigonus's wayward but talented nephew, Ptolemy had him executed and moved into the political void that his death created. Ptolemy's strength compelled Cratisipolis to surrender her strongholds at Corinth and Sicyon and to retire from public life. Polyperchon, now fighting on Cassander's behalf, tried to march on Ptolemy, but he was intercepted in Boeotia by the Greeks there and defeated in humiliating fashion. After that point, Cassander could no longer depend on the aging general's competence and had to serve in person on the Greek front. The Fourth War of the Successors broke out in 308 and lasted until 301. During this war, it was once again a coalition of everyone who was not Antigonus against Antigonus. One notable party who abstained from the early going of this war was Seleucus, who made a separate peace with Antigonus early on and decided to work on shoring up his eastern frontier rather than fighting alongside of the men who had left him for dead a few years before. Ptolemy was at or near the height of his power at this time, and his forces had used their naval mobility to establish footholds throughout Asia Minor, and he had also seized, seized much of Palestine and Syria. Antigonus focused his early efforts on Ptolemy, but his son Demetrius went to Athens to combat Cassander. Demetrius overthrew Cassander's governor in Athens, Demetrius of Phalaren, declared the city free again in accord with his father's earlier proclamation, and then left to fight Ptolemy at sea. With Demetrius gone, Cassander and Polyperchon campaigned in Greece. We don't have any details of this campaign, but Diodorus claims that they laid waste to a great deal of land. Apparently, Cassander did not gain enough to prevent Demetrius's easy return. In 306-305, Demetrius won the greatest victory of his career at Rhodes, and then he returned to Greece to focus on making war against Cassander. Following the great victory at Rhodes, both Antigonus and Demetrius assumed the title of king, thus setting a precedent that was soon adopted by all of their rivals. Cassander lost a battle against Demetrius, who then founded a new Hellenic League under his own leadership for the express purpose of making war on Cassander. These setbacks rattled Cassander, who sued for peace. However, Antigonus rejected Cassander's terms and Demetrius invaded Thessaly, one of the major pillars of Macedonian power. Cassander and Demetrius squared off in several battles, all of which were indecisive. Eventually, Cassander's ally Lysimachus, stationed in Thrace, was able to distract Demetrius by invading Asia Minor and forcing Demetrius to send some of his troops back to the empire's core territories. Once Demetrius shifted to Asia, Cassander was also able to commit his army to the fray alongside of Lysimachus's. By 301 BCE, 
the Allied forces of Lysimachus and Cassander had made significant territorial gains in Asia Minor, but Demetrius and old man Antigonus had cornered their army in Phrygia. Cassander was not present for this battle, possibly already suffering ill effects from edema or else feeling compelled to be personally present in Macedon, but his trusted general Prepileus and his brother Plistarchus were both present serving alongside of Lysimachus with large contingents. When Seleucus entered the war as an ally of Cassander and Lysimachus and arrived with a sizable contingent, there was a great battle. The greatest battle of the successor period, the Battle of Ipsus, resulted in the death of Antigonus, the partial fragmentation of his empire, and in the judgment of some historians, marked the end of the possibility that any one man would be able to reunite the whole of Alexander's empire. For Cassander, news of this battle was probably the best news from abroad that he ever received. After Ipsus, the primary beneficiaries were Lysimachus and Seleucus. Cassander, however, as the patriarch of the Antipatrid clan, was able to reward two of his brothers for their loyalty during the trying times of his kingship. Plistarchus, who had been vital in Cassander's Thessaly campaign against Demetrius and who had also fought well at Ipsus, received the province of Cilicia as his own fiefdom. One eccentric brother, Alexarchus, received permission to build a city called Uranopolis, the heavenly city, for his obscure utopia or cult, which propounded doctrines that were impenetrably arcane. Unfortunately, we don't know all that much about the last four years of Cassander's life. The post-Ipsus order held for a few years, but started to break down by 298 due to the intrigues of others. Lysimachus and Ptolemy were making common cause at a time when Seleucus and Demetrius were making amends. Since their dealings involved Asia Minor and the Eastern Mediterranean, Cassander stayed out of the fray. In addition to his declining health, Cassander had to confront increasingly stiff resistance from the Greeks. At about this time, the Boeotians and Aetolians made an alliance which effectively cut Cassander's Macedon all from his holdings in southern Greece. Death came for Antipater's son before he could resolve that crisis. While his city-building projects are officially dated to the first couple years of his life, or reign, excuse me, it is unlikely that he was able to dedicate much time or effort to these projects during those years due to his war commitments, so it may be during this time of relative peace that Cassander actually did some of the building. At any rate, Cassander had edema, which was called dropsy at the time, a swelling disease that can prove deadly and result in lethargy. How long Cassander suffered from edema is unknown, but it may very well have started many years prior to his death. In 297, Cassander passed away of edema at the age of about 53 years of age. His oldest son, now Philip IV of Macedon, seems to have been a capable and conscientious young man, but he too suffered from edema and did not survive his father by very long. In my video on the last Antipatrids, I will discuss Philip IV and Cassander's other sons in greater detail. Cassander's reputation during antiquity was overwhelmingly negative. His decision to murder Alexander IV and Olympias, as well as the rumors that he had had Alexander the Great poisoned at Babylon, made him the biggest villain in the crime drama that was the successor period. However, in modern times, scholars have been warming up to Cassander, slowly but surely. While he was a cold-blooded killer and ceaseless plotter, he was not much worse than his contemporaries, if he was worse at all. In fact, unlike many of his contemporaries, Cassander's reign was constructive and led to the betterment of the kingdom that he ruled. On an individual level, despite being painted as an effeminate coward by his enemies, Cassander seems to have had a fair amount of charisma even if he lacked his father's gravitas. A brilliant diplomat, Cassander often found ways to foil Antigonus the One-Eyed, and he was able to win over Polyperchon after depriving him of the Empire's highest office, turning his own son against him, and ruining his life by any reasonable metric. Uniquely among men who murdered Argeids, Cassander was able to weather the backlash and did so after killing Alexander's the, Alexander the Great's mother and then his son. Perdiccas, by contrast, was not able to sustain the damage incurred by killing one of Alexander's numerous half-siblings. 
As a general, Cassander was much better than his limited record prior to coming to power would suggest. Taking on veterans of Alexander's campaigns, such as Polyperchon and Aristomedus, Cassander proved to be more capable than most as a field commander. He was even able to hold his own against Demetrius the Besieger, one of the greatest captains of the time, and someone who had wielded a larger army than the one Cassander had. However, Cassander also seems to have been deeply insecure, and there were instances, such as his decision to execute Aristonous of Pella, where he acted dishonorably out of fear. All things considered, Cassander was one of the most brilliant statesmen of his day, warts and all, and he had a talent for governing Macedon on par with Philip II and Antipater. Had he and his elder, eldest son enjoyed better health, it is quite possible that the maps of the Hellenistic world would feature Antipatrid Macedon rather than Antigonid Macedon.